everyone and a very warm welcome to our service of morning worship from Christchurch Billericay on Sunday the 19th of February. My name is Reverend Margaret Fowler and I'm the Associate Priest at Christchurch. I'll be leading us through this service. 
Today is the Sunday next before Lent. So on Wednesday, we have Ash Wednesday and there will be a service of the imposition of ashes held at St John's Church at Outwood Common at 7.30 p.m. If you can join us then, that would be lovely. It would be good to see you there. And then every Wednesday following, right up until Holy Week, there will be a Lent course, a team Lent course. And uh, this is the booklet that accompanies the, the course. It's called, uh, the course is called Dust and Glory. And it's a Lent journey of faith, failure and forgiveness. So that will be for six weeks right up until Holy Week. The books are £1.50 each. Uh, they are in the church. Um, in fact, they're in all the team churches if you would like to buy one. Um, but uh, if you can't get up to the church, do give the church office a ring and someone will bring, bring one down to you. So that's our Lent course. Um, it will be held at different churches every week. It begins um, the Wednesday week, 1st of March, at Emmanuel Church at 7.30pm and um, the team rector, Reverend Paul Carr, will be leading our first uh, Lent course. And after that, it will be um, held at different churches around the team each week and different people will be leading. So do join us for the Lent course if you can. But if you can't, these uh, Lent readings um, are very good and it le will lead you through more or less what we will be learning. So don't be disappointed if you can't join us. Um, we have fair trade Easter eggs in Christchurch. These Easter eggs aren't available in the shops. The book, the, uh, there's a little booklet inside which tells the Easter story uh, for children. So uh, you can't get them in Tesco's, but you can get them in the churches. So again, do call in to pick up your Easter eggs or phone the church office and we will deliver them to you. So that's all the notices for now. So shall we just be quiet and... Uh, prepare ourselves to worship together this morning. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, direct our thoughts, teach us to pray, lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we come to our confession. This is when we have the opportunity to say sorry to God for anything that we might have left undone. We meant to do it, but... We just didn't get round to it. And maybe we let someone down this week. Um, maybe there's something else we want to say sorry for. So shall we just take a moment and uh, reflect on our week and see what uh, we feel we need to bring before the Lord this morning. Lord Jesus Christ. We confess we have failed you, as did your first disciples. We ask for your mercy and your help. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love 
in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now as the loved and forgiven people of God, we're going to hear uh, from God's word. Les Shepherd is going to bring us our Bible readings, after which Pete Fisher will be preaching. The Old Testament reading is taken from Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 to 18. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commands I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua his assistant, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in the dispute can go to them. When Moses went up the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. The Gospel reading is taken from Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 to 9. After six days Jesus took with him Peter, James and John the brother of James and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that through these words this morning, we will all see you more clearly and understand you a little better, that we can come closer to you than we have been. In Jesus' name, Amen. How do you see God? Well, you can't, right? Because in Colossians 1, Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. But when we talk about God, what sort of image do we have in our heads? Is it the classic image of an old man with a long beard sitting in the heavens with a th sitting on a throne in the heavens? Is it perhaps a younger man with long hair and flowing robes? walking around in the desert. Are either of them wearing a crown? Or is it perhaps something more sophisticated or just different? I don't have an image of God as a person in my head. It's more a presence, a connection, a power, a holiness than it is a person. Of course, when we talk about Jesus, then I do have an image of a person in my head, but not one with any particularly defined characteristics. As I look at these two passages this morning, I'm going to consider how each of the characters that we meet sees God, and how that affects 
what they believe and therefore what they do and how they behave. I'll start with the Old Testament. The reading we have was from Exodus 12, 24 to 50. And I'll treat Moses and Aaron as one person while I do this, because Aaron basically is just the messenger from Moses to the people. So Moses is issuing God's instructions to the elders of Israel. They are probably the most important instructions that Moses has ever given them. How to avoid the angel of death, the destroyer, in verse 23. You will, I hope, remember that Egypt, where the Israelites were slaves, had suffered nine plagues. Water turning to blood, frogs, lice, flies, pestilence, boils, thunderstorms of hail, locusts, darkness. And the tenth is about to arrive. Death of the firstborn. In all of this, Moses has been the person that God has been working through. So despite his initial doubts about his ability and the crimes he has committed in the past, he is now a faithful servant of God. He sees God as his master and the saviour of his people. He will do what God tells him to, even when the Israelites are less than happy to obey. Putting blood on the doorpost wouldn't have been so much of an issue for them as I suspect it would be if we were asked to do it now. The Israelites see God as a great power. They have seen the plagues come and go and they now have enough experience of God to be ready to obey, even when the commands seem a little odd. We get to a phrase that occurs only a couple of times in the Old Testament, partway through this passage. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded. Now, I bet a lot of them did that because they were afraid. They'd seen the plagues escalate. They'd heard what Moses was saying the next one was and realised that it would probably be best to do as they were told. Sadly, their complete obedience would not last. The other main character in this story is Pharaoh. Pharaoh thinks of himself first, primarily as a god. And of course, he's the owner of the Israelite slaves. He therefore sees Israel's God as a competitor and someone who might take away all the slaves that he's using to build his buildings, make his bricks. He's not been convinced by the plagues so far. Mostly all they've done is strengthen his resolve. The Bible calls it hardening his heart. But the final plague strikes closer to home. He loses his own son. And that pushes him over the edge. And now he's determined to get rid of the whole troublesome lot of them. And hopefully their invisible God will go along with them too. He's not just letting them go. He's turfing them out. He's evicting them. This change of heart doesn't end there, though. Look at the end of verse 32. And also bless me. Pharaoh is asking for a blessing from Moses, which will, of course, mean a blessing from the invisible God that he's trying to get rid of. What an enormous change of heart that is on Pharaoh's part. He realises that Egypt's gods are not as powerful as Israel's gods. Some of the Egyptians saw the Israelites and their god as something more, something different, 
something better and decided to leave with them and packed up their livestock and their families and their tents and their whole way of life and followed the Israelites. It's hard to know whether they cared for God or just decided to follow the winner or whether it was a case of the grass is always greener. Perhaps life in Egypt for the Egyptians wasn't so great. And this led, from Moses' point of view, to a whole raft of new rules to ensure that those who were taking the Passover and involved in the remembrance ceremonies were the woes that were truly committed to God. That they were genuinely real followers and not just some sort of hangers-on. In the New Testament reading, Peter, James and John will see Jesus in an entirely different light. Yes, I know, it's a terrible pun, you can groan now. Have you ever tried to picture the scene, though? I found an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called The Transfiguration. It is clearly inspired by this event. Here's what the special effects crew on TNG made of it. There's nothing to fear. That's a pretty good attempt, I think. And it helped me to imagine the scene a little more clearly. And I hope it did, you too. But more important to us this morning is what Peter, James and John thought about it. Peter is his usual self, a man of action, trying to do the best thing in whatever situation he finds himself in. When Moses and Elijah appear, he wants to put up shelters for them. Mark tells us he did not know what to do and what to say because he was frightened. That's probably an understatement. If you stood there and somebody suddenly changed into a white shining person, you'd be frightened. Well, I would anyway. After all, they had only gone up the mountain to pray. We have no record of what James and John think at this point, but I would expect they were as frightened as Peter, perhaps enough to make them silent. Luke tells us that Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about his departure, which which he was about to bring to fulfilment at Jerusalem. So this would have happened, this transfiguration would have happened, at a time when the disciples had been with Jesus for quite a long time. But it's the voice, not the sight, that really makes the difference to them. The voice from the cloud says, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. If they were afraid before, they are all terrified now and fall to the ground, face down, worshipping God. And Jesus tells them to get up and to not be afraid. And the event is over. If they were having any doubts at all about who Jesus was at this point, this was an important event for them. It can only have helped to convince them that Jesus is something very, very special, even if they didn't actually take in and believe the words that they heard. After all, Moses and Elijah are the two most important people in the Old Testament. They have seen something of the amazing power of God. And yet there is Jesus, gently telling them not to be afraid. On the way down the mountain, they are told not to tell the others about what they have seen and heard. The story must be kept until after Jesus' death and resurrection. It's too close to a proof, really, of who Jesus is. 
because of what they have seen, Peter, James and John must now have a different view of Jesus, of who he is and what he is about to do. Despite this, or perhaps because of it, they still find it hard to accept that he is going to have to die and that he will be raised from the dead. We've seen quite a few different views of God this morning. His power was shown to us through the plagues in Egypt, where he controlled events to bring about a particular outcome. His power had been shown to us also through the change he made to his son, from looking like a man, just like you and me, to being something really quite different. That's a power over the physical world not just over the people who are in it. His love is shown in his plans for the Passover. The feast will happen every year as a remembrance for the Israelites of what happened when they were rescued from the slavery in Egypt. It will not only teach the next generation and all the people about what happened, but it will bring them together. His love has been shown to his disciples too, as he prepares them for the events to come that they will struggle to deal with. And as always, he assures them that they are never alone and that they never need to be afraid in his presence. In both readings, we see God taking the initiative, leading his people forward. Plagues show us that God has a plan He set out to rescue the Israelites from Egypt, and he succeeded. He set out to redeem the world through his son, coming as a man, dying on the cross and being raised again. We saw only a small part of this plan this morning, just that one little incident with the transfiguration. But unlike Exodus, this plan is still in process and we are part of it. So hopefully what we have seen of God this morning will help us to be a bigger part of that plan and we will be ready for whatever Jesus leads us into next. Amen. And so we're thinking about what experiences we might learn about God as we go up a mountain, as we sing Lead Us Up the Mountain with Matt Redmond. Please join in if you would like to. Lead us up the mountain Lead us to the place Your glory dwells, God Lead us up the mountain Lead us to the place Your glory dwells, God Lead us up the mountain To the place your glory dwells, God, lead us up the mountain, lead us to the place your glory dwells, God, lead us up the mountain, lead us to the place your glory dwells, God. Lead us up the mountain Lead us to the place Your glory dwells, God Moses and Jesus experienced something really special when they went up the mountain to meet with the Lord. We'd all love to have mountaintop experiences meeting Jesus, wouldn't we? Sometimes they happen and sometimes they don't, but we mustn't be disappointed if they don't happen because Jesus is with us all the time. We just have to acknowledge him in our lives and that's what we're going to do now. We're going to affirm our faith together, knowing that he will be with us whether or not we experience those wonderful things that uh, both Moses and Jesus experienced. 
So if you would like to, please stand. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now Angela Wood is going to lead us in our prayers. Let us pray. In the reading this morning from Matthew, Jesus told his disciples not to be afraid. Father God, we ask that each, we each come to know that you are with us in the easy times, difficult times, good and bad. Help us not to be afraid, but to turn to you in everything, to call out to you. Heavenly Father, thank you for helping Jesus to overcome the temptations that were put in his way in the desert. Please help us to be strong like Jesus was and to remember your words in the Bible as Jesus did and put them into practice as we stand up for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, help us to work together to share what we have so that everyone has what they need. Help us to be generous with everything we have. As a time of Lent approaches, we often think of giving up something. But Lord, also help us to give at this time as you give to us. We pray for the countries hit by disasters, for the people in Turkey and Syria. Lord, be with them, comfort them. But also we ask that the world can work together to help them in their need. We pray for the people in New Zealand in the state of emergency after the cyclone with the terrible floods. For the people with countries in Africa still with drought, we lift Ukraine to you. We pray for those in need here in our country and around the world. We thank you for the aid agencies and all volunteers and ask that you protect them. Lord, help us to be generous and share what we have. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us to build a better world where each of us can become the best person we can be. In this, we pray for the leaders and governments of the world, that you would guide them in their decisions, that they work for the good of all. Give them the strength and wisdom needed and for the right people to encourage them. We pray for our church leaders in Billericay and thank you for the churches together and that they work together, continue this work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, God, that you are loving and forgiving. Help us to love people in the same way as you love us. Let us pray now with that same love for those who are sick, having treatment, an operation, for those who are sad, those who have lost someone. We lift them now to you, Lord, in a moment of quiet. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's bring our prayers together as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And the collect for today, Sunday next before Lent. Holy God, you know the disorder of our sinful lives. Set straight our crooked hearts and bend our wills to love your goodness and your glory in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Shine, Jesus, shine. Lord, we do pray that you will shine in our hearts today and always. So now we're nearly at the end of our service for this week. Don't forget the Ash Wednesday service at St John the Divine on Wednesday at 7.30pm. You'd be most welcome if you are able to come. And don't forget the Lent course booklet. If you would like a copy, just uh, pop into the church and pick one up for £1.50 or phone the church office and we will have one delivered to you. So now we come to the blessing. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light upon our paths and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>